Uh, hello everyone, uh, I am Rageesh Ramachandran. Welcome to the Agriculture Application Session of Rose Industrial Conference 2020. I'm really glad to see you all here. In this session, we will discuss about advancement in rose-based software for agricultural fields. We have three speakers with very interesting topics for this session. Uh, audience can uh, ask questions uh, in the question tab of this web card and also can participate in the polling session of this web card. Our first uh, speaker for this session is Heiko Engiman, and he is the Institute Manager at Ro in the Institute of Applied Automation and Mechatronics at FH Aachen. Uh, he will talk about ETAROB, an autonomous agriculture robot, and he has obtained his uh, master's uh, in mechatronics, robotics, and automation from Aachen University of Applied Science, uh, FH Aachen. Uh, the microphone is all yours, uh, Heiko. I would also like to welcome everybody to um, the presentation um, where I present our work uh, in terms of the agriculture robot Eterop. And um, I would like to start with a short introduction into mobile robotics, which is one of the key future technologies enabling a large number of applications. Um, yeah, we are already surrounded by autonomous vacuum cleaners, mowers, drones, or even humanoid robots. And for example, autonomous driving is like one of the main research topics for the automotive industry. Nowadays, the development of autonomous mobile systems is supported by a new way of thinking. The use of open source so software and hardware components generates a lot faster development cycles. In the area of field robotics, which is a subcategory of mobile robotics, the amount of agriculture applications is constantly increasing. Where precision farming, weed control, and harvesting are only a couple of possible use cases for mobile robots. Today's farmers in Europe face uprising challenges and competitions in a global market. For instance, the society demands and more transparency uh, on, of the whole cultivation process and the overall value chain. Chemicals are getting prohibited and the electrification of agriculture machinery is still a problem. Conventional agriculture machinery became larger and heavier for global industrialization of food production. Meanwhile, especially in Europe, connected farmlands are rather small. These big machines increasingly compact the fertile soil and in conclusion, the process of soil irrigation and preparation demands up to 40 or 50% of the fuel used in agriculture. Heavy soil cultivation requires particularly powerful tractors, which are not nearly utilized to their capacity in other common production processes, like seeding or spraying. Especially in vegetable production, processes such as weed control or harvesting are still carried out by field workers, and those became really rare due to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. The field robot Eterop aims to decrease monotonous and physically demanding field work by automation and integrated digitization. Digitization approaches, for instance, precision farming, allows fertilizers um, to be applied in small quantities throughout the entire growing season. This can significantly reduce the leaching of nitrates and the accumulation in groundwater. Prediction models based on big data approaches are used to supply plants in every vegetation stage with nutrition according to their needs. However, the entrance to the market is quite difficult since you have to compete with standard agriculture solutions. An edge is given in the area of high value plants like vegetables or herbs. The agriculture value chain includes many different processes, from tillage to seeding and plant rating. It includes also crop management, like weed control and fertilizing. Harvesting, for instance, is a high value process, but also rather complex, depending on the crop plant type. Currently, the focus is on phenotyping and plant rating, as well as weed control but many projects address already harvesting and full farming concepts. In the long term, different solutions might exist for different plant types and production steps. In agriculture exists a high potential in terms of automation and digitization 
over a wide variety of different plant and crop lights. In 2017, a team of robotic enthusiasts started with the project ETEROP under the supervision of Professor Stefan Karlweit. We started with a small prototype where, and we set the focus there on sensor integration and on the kinematic. In 2018, we finished the development of the second generation, which then was already tested on the field and included some technical demonstrations on chemical-free weeding applications. The actual version was introduced in 2019, which follows a modular concept and is currently used in different research activities. The requirements for an agriculture robots are different to, for example, industrial mobile robots, but they share some um, same characteristics. For example, a precise and reliable localization is a key requirement for the path following and the process execution. Every plant on the field represents money for the farmer. Therefore, a stable path following is needed to secure that no of the plants are damaged. In addition, uh, a precise uh, um, localization is also needed for the process execution. Um, to monitor each plant uh, in, um, in terms of the position and the relation to a global coordinate um, frame enables us um, also new types of application in the context of precision farming. Um, safety is often called the major challenge in agricultural robotics, and it's really different to industrial applications. This is, for example, caused by the um, changing environmental parameters and also the height of the plants, which can cover any kind of animals or even humans. So like that classical approaches like only 2D um, safety lighters aren't efficient. Um, in addition, an agriculture robot um, has to provide a mechanical robustness and a high operational readiness. From the economic point of view, um, an agriculture robot um, makes only sense if it can operate for a long time without any kind of human interaction. And um, this is especially true since um, field robots um, are typically a lot smaller than these conventional big agriculture machinery. So they have a disadvantage in, um, in terms of area per hour. Um, following these requirements, we developed um, the field robot ETEROP. The uh, mainframe of the ETEROP can be configured in a C or an H form, depending on the size of the implement it has to carry. And for larger applications <clears throat> and working areas, the middle section of the ETEROP can be enlarged and the whole robot drives then sidewise. Um, the ETEROP uses a steered four-wheeled kinematic um, that is so-called um, swivel wheels. And for coast reduction, the outer shell of the mainframe of the ETEROP um, is a monocoque. And the rest is then realized as a welding construction. Um, the design of the ETEROP is modular to satisfy research demands as well as um, intense field tests. The um, energy system of the ETEROP consists of a battery battery, uh, or buffer battery, <laughs> to deal with uh, load peaks. And the um, buffer battery is combined with a diesel generator. On the other side um, of the ETEROP and is equipped um, with the controllers and the communication system, as well uh, with some various um, sensoric devices. In this age configuration, um, it provides two tool slots, which enable the parallel execution of processes. For example, um, a combined, um, uh, for example, um, fertilizing and weed control. Um, the um, ETEROP uses a serial hybrid power train. Um, it is made uh, uh, out of a five kilowatt power buffer battery and a diesel generator, as well as four 48 volt hub motors. Um, due to the buffer battery compensating the peak loads of the system, the diesel generator can be quite small. 
Um, this approach has the great advantage uh, of a significant reduction of the energy consumption. Um, as well, um, fully electric systems, they need to be recharged in constant time intervals. And um, especially on the field, you don't have the infrastructure to do that. Um, so um, such a hybrid powertrain, it can be refilled on the field and even like um, uh, on the fly, refilling processes can be implemented. Each individual hub motor of the Eterop can output up to 800 Newton meters. Um, what gives the, um, the robot the capability to carry quite high payloads up to 1000 kilograms. Um, the high payloads is especially needed for processes which require any kind of liquid like fertilizing or chemical weed control. The four wheel steering and the um, height adaption of the implement slot is realized with a high efficient speed control hydraulic system. Uh, in addition, um, the interrupt features um, a race double suspension system for each wheel, um, which provides then in the end the capability to turn each wheel um, up to 180 degrees and gives the system an overall ground clearance of 90 centimeters. Um, autonomous, uh, autonomous operation of a field robot uh, is a lot more than just autonomous driving. Um, it also includes the process control and monitoring. In fact, already today, many conventional agricult uh, agriculture machines provide GPS assistance to drive on the field. On the other hand, the um, process control and the monitoring is uh, normally executed by human operators. Autonomous driving on a, on a field can't be as simple as a line follower for many agriculture processes. Um, however, that's not that easy as it sounds. Um, you need, at first, you need a robust and reliable localization that provides an accurate position of the field robot. Uh, in the last years, the huge progress in global GNNS-based localization and the related sensor technology uh, enabled like sub-centimeter accuracy. However, this global localization must be improved with um, uh, local features, for instance, um, plant pattern recognition or odometry data. And therefore the um, Iterob features a multi-data sensor fusion approach um, to provide the position of the robot with a high frequency. And also, and that's important in case um, the GPS signal breaks down for a short um, time period. Um, the safety concept has to detect obstacles under different environmental parameters, um, which are, for example, different daytimes and weather conditions, as well as um, different terrains and um, growth stages of the crop plants. Active path planning can be a really nice and a great uh, improvement for the future. If you think about um, uh, active collision avoidance via bypassing, for example, that would increase um, the uptime of um, such field robots. Or the um, autonomous approach to um, service points, uh, which would enable um, automatic tool changes or the automatic uh, refill of um, working supplies. Um, our safety concept um, combines um, um, hard safety and um, soft safety components. So the um, hard safety components are, um, yeah, they typically provide a um, high performance level and they are um, integrated on the PLC level. On the other hand, we have the um, soft safety components, which form a workspace monitoring system, um, which covers um, the 360 degree around the robot. And um, this monitoring system consists of multiple sensors. So we have a 3D LiDAR and um, thermal cameras as well as RGB cameras. And the concept then in the end is to um, combine the strengths of the different sensor times and um, therefore compensate um, the individual weakness. And um, for the safety system itself, um, reliability is a basic requirement and um, both parameters, precision and recall, which are quite common in these areas, are uh, equally important. So um, if you have a, a low precision, that result in obstructing the um, autonomous navigation. 
A low recall, on the other hand, um, indicates mishumans or animals, uh, which will deny the um, desired um, preventively behavior. Um, we use a concept or we use approach um, that we um, fuse the confidence intervals of the uh, individual detectors by applying the um, geometric mean. And the resulting, the fused confidence level is um, uh, significantly superior to um, each individual detector and it provides an average position of over 90%. So let's have a look at the process control, which is often defined as the major challenge in agricultural robotics. And the basic principle is uh, simple. You perform a process, for instance, here, tillage, to get from a current state to a desired result. However, this principle um, requires, even for humans, a lot of experience and is dependent on various parameters. Um, the use of methods from the field of artificial intelligence is a promising approach to enable process control in agriculture robotics. Since our focus is on crop management and um, reading in, uh, in particular, um, we focused on the detection and um, uh, segmentation of um, crop and wheat plants. And um, therefore, methods based on deep learning have proven to be robust and precise in classification and um, segmentation of crop and wheat plants. One major challenge closely related to the model performance is the quality and quantity of the training set. Um, traditionally, the generation of a data set for um, object detection is time consuming and costly. In contrast to data sets obtained from the real world, the generation of synthetic data can be fully automated, making it suitable for um, such computer vision tasks with um, high objects um, variation and, uh, and environment variation. Therefore, we enlarged our data set with photorealistic synthetic subsegments. And the major challenge there is to um, close the gap between the simulated data and the real world counterpart the so-called reality gap. Um, how we do it, um, um, we, create, uh, uh, we created high detail 3D scans of crop and wheat plants. You can see some examples here. And by mutating the properties of these 3D models, we were able to generate a large and diverse database for our plant models. The next step, we use C, uh, CGI rendering software to create virtual walls. Within these worlds, we create virtual farmlands with configurable um, soil, um, season, and weather conditions. The rendering process automatically generates then the annotated dataset subsegments, uh, which we use to enlarge our real world dataset. So, to answer the question, for what do we use ROS uh, in the development of our field for about ATROP, um, it's quite simple, um, basically for everything. So, um, we use ROS as a framework for, for our field robot, um, as it provides the core functionalities that we need for our prototyping process. Um, for example, the um, standardized um, communication infrastructure and the default code structure make it easy for us to work as a big team at um, such a complex project. Then um, ROS provides powerful visualization and um, debugging tools, which are extremely helpful for us um, um, doing the field tests. And the um, seamless integration of um, other open source projects, um, for example, PCL, OpenCV, um, uh, or um, MoveIt, um, enables us then in the end to create, uh, to, um, yeah, to focus on the uh, creation of solutions instead of, um, um, yeah, to um, develop the infrastructure. And um, the simulation environment, for example, of the well-designed simulator Gazebo is another essential part in our development pipeline. Um, it enables us to develop hardware and software in the loop without time-consuming field tests. And um, yeah, I can say that we use many different ROS tools uh, which are provided by the um, community, um, reaching from navigation to perception. So, um, 
I think I can really say that um, the open source spirit from the ROS community is, uh, is what made the field robot ETHROP possible. Um, the um, actual uh, robot is currently used in a research project called um, Zevia. In this research uh, um, project, we um, collaborate together with a company from Aachen. The name is uh, CropZone. And CropZone has developed a non-chemical plant control technique by applying electricity. And it's, that is a quite um, interesting technique um, as the um, applied electricity destroys the chlorophyll and the water system of the plants. This concept um, has been around already for a long time, but CropZone was able to significantly reduce the amount of energy that you need by applying a um, silent formulation before the treatment. And the environmental impact of these formulations is uh, very low. Um, so, for example, they are also used in the area of um, organic farming. But till now, um, this technique is only used at a large scale for field preparation, for example, um, for seeding or for harvesting. In this example here um, um, for potatoes. And the aim of the project is then um, to make this technique selective so that it can be used as a uh, replacement for um, classical chemical weed control. And therefore, the uh, metal components uh, which apply the uh, um, electricity um, have to be moved around the crop lands in order to deny any kind of contact. And in the context of the project, uh, we developed the intelligence of the system to detect and segment the crop and wheat plants, as well as the um, active control of the individual metal applicators. Um, so here I come now to an end of uh, this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I uh, was able to give you a short overview about the agriculture robot um, Eterop. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Heiko, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, the safety components of your robot is very much impressive, and I can relate with the, the Tesla sort of pilot. Uh, now we will go, with, go to Felipe Dos Santos, who is a senior researcher from Ines Tech, Porto, Portugal. And he has obtained his uh, PhD in robotics, and he is here to talk about the roles in agriculture robots for permanent woody crops. Now I invite uh, Felipe for his presentation. So before I will present a um, brief overview what we are doing about uh, agricultural robots for permanent woody crops. And most of our work is basically on raw, so it makes sense. Before, uh, before I start speaking about what we do, I must speak about ourselves and we are Nestec is a private non-profit organization. We are between academia and company. So we don't sell products. We just build uh, prototypes afterwards are commercialized by companies or startups in the world. Uh, in, our, uh, in our research center, we have uh, two groups that are working mainly in robotics for industry, ocean, mining and agriculture and forestry. What brings us to this presentation is the, the, the work that we are realizing in our laboratory that is called Laboratory for Robotics and IoT for Smart Precision Agriculture and Forestry. Okay, so how has this laboratory born? Uh, this uh, was born in 2014. We, are, we, have, we have looked for the Portuguese reality and we have tried to find out how the robotic technologies could help the uh, agricultural and forestry sector. And afterwards, we have also looked for the strategic agenda for the robotics. Uh, we have also looked for the main trends for the precision agriculture, that is the concept of measure everything that we can and afterwards take a, a decision support system to have a kind of some kind of prescription map that afterwards can be applied on the train. So is to measure and apply the right quantity in the right place and in the right amount of uh, product on the field. 
And afterwards, we have also looked for the main players in the sector that are producing big machinery to plant uh, sometimes uh, grams of uh, seeds. And what is the problem of these big machineries? They create a big problem that is the soil compactation. And another issue that they have sometimes is if the machine breaks down, the every ecosystem stops because there is one machinery operating in contrast to having several machines operating to, 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 to make the seed. So what we have looked at here is a, a problem that we can solve with smaller robots and small size robots to, to tackle the problem. And so our aim in this res uh, research laboratory is to research and develop modular, safe and autonomous small size agricultural machinery and what we define as a small size is something below one ton of weight. Uh, this machinery should work in steep slope pioneers because it's where we have a lot of high premium quality of products in Portugal. Uh, but, never the, but the problem is we have low levels of mechanization because there is a challenge environment for uh, mechanization. And so we are looking for that uh, reality. And we know if we tackle this problem and we have a robot that is able to operate in this steep slope vineyards, it will be able to operate in another uh, environment uh, in agriculture. We are also looking for the greenhouses productions in Portugal with more cost-effective technologies that can uh, eliminate the use of uh, operators in the harvesting and treatment processes where most of the time infections can occur for the plants. And so we can remove the people uh, to reduce the, the, the problems that we have on the plants. And the third, the third context of application that we have at the laboratory is to collect biomass from the forestry. Forestry can be seen as an agriculture sector also. Uh, and uh, in Portugal, in the majority of the South countries of Europe, we have a lot of biomass that is placed on this forestry and we need uh, some tools to remove this biomass in a cost effective way and we think that robotics can do that play that uh, that job so our to drive our research in this laboratory we have four milestones the first one we have already accomplished and we have we aim to have robots that are able to go a steep slope vineyards be able to localize itself and be able to make a path planning safe enough uh, for the robot doesn't fall and do the right path and the right uh, job for collecting that data from a steep slope vineyard. And afterwards, and now at this moment we are in this stage, is to developing precision spraying robots that are able to go to these vineyards and apply the right quantity of uh, chemical products in the right place. And afterwards, we are also working in pruning and harvesting. And in this to the last uh, uh, milestones that we have for the, the uh, our research, we have a lot of AI technologies to be developed. A lot of data sets that we need to collect and not all uh, data sets that we need uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to, um, to annotate. And so if we can say that, um, our, if we can divide the, our robotic technologies uh, in several blocks, I would say that we have a long tradition and a long history that we have uh, drink it from the industrial um, uh, development of robots. That is the navigation uh, stack, that is localization and path planning. And here we are, local, we are working mainly in navigation stack that is able to localize the robot, even if a GPS fails or a GNS solution is not available all the time. And we are also looking for path planning and, uh, uh, and the path plan that are aware of the center of gravity of the robot, but also aware of the uh, slope of the terrains and give the right uh, trajectory that is safer for the robot to do not fall on these vineyards. We are working a lot on visual perception. We, a lot, we have more than, uh, I would say, 1,000 images annotated with trunks, with fruits, grapes, tomatoes, for the robot to use this information to localize the robot itself in this context using these natural features. We are also uh, taking care about, uh, about the, the advanced control, manipulation, and grasping. The safety questions, as said before, that is a big issue for agricultural machinery. And 
we are also trying to be uh, aligned to the main standards that exist in the, in the agricultural sector, namely the ISOBUS and the J1939. Uh, uh, okay, and we have figured out that developing this uh, smart technology on top of ROSH will have impact on the designing, on implements and uh, the machinery itself. So this is a, an example of our robot operating in a steep stove vineyard in the in a, in a Douro, uh, in a Portuguese vineyard that is placed in, in a steep slope vineyard in a steep slope context. As you can see, the robot is able to to go to this vineyard to localize, and afterwards in the in the below you can see some um, uh, maps of the maturity that we collect using this robot on the on these fields. Okay, and this is uh, this is an interesting. Uh, use case where the robot was able to localize even uh, when we have jammed the GNS signal and when we have blocked the GNS signal, okay? And it's able to localize the robot using the, um, the, the natural features that we have on these vineyards, namely the trunks that are placed in these vineyards. Uh, besides uh, vineyards, we are also working for the forestry. And as I said to you before, uh, we have several issues to clean the forest. And these four pictures illustrates it by itself, all these operations are being realized in the forestry. Most of them are uh, realized by hand operations with the hand tools. Uh, and this creates some uh, uh, hard problems in terms of cost, of, of the cost of the operations. And in the below, you see uh, tractors that we operated by operators that sometimes have uh, some injuries and accidents and that we want uh, to avoid in the future. Uh, here is an uh, a video that is showing our uh, robot operating fully autonomously in a forestry and that is able to localize itself. Here you can see this is not a problem of the robot localizing, it's putting the tree below uh, because in this video I cannot show you the, um, the hand tool that is able to cut the tree and uh, smash it uh, in a small pieces that can afterwards be used by, uh, by the industry. As you can see, the robot is able to localize and execute some uh, danger operations in, the, in a big slope. And one of, we are always below uh, of this robot at this moment because we cannot ensure the totally safe of this robot. And so uh, this is one of the, the main issues that we are now facing uh, in the future. One main aspect that is, was uh, uh, identified by our main stakeholders and users for this technology is that this, tech, this robotic technology can bring a lot of interesting information for the management of the forestry. As you can see in the, the right uh, video, you can see that we can identify a lot of trees and quantify the quantity of woody material that we have on this forestry uh, that afterwards can be used by the, the forestry operators or forestry managers. In the next year, we plan to develop considering our previous experience on the past with these robots to develop an, a small, uh, uh, a more customized solution that can operate in both contexts of uh, application in the agricultural sector and in the forestry. We will develop the robot fully customized to be able to take technology for precision spraying and for harvesting uh, harvesting to be realized in the forestry, but also in the, um, in the um, in the in the agricultural side in in, in special in woody crops like steep slope vineyards. Uh, here we will use the concepts concepts of taking batteries from Barta that can be plugged in the in the smart grids and can be also be considered an element of uh, energy in the agriculture. We we will also work with the edge AI and uh, that will have more advanced features for detecting the environment and identify natural features that we can afterwards use it uh, to localize the robot itself in the environment. And ROS, as said before, is in a main core uh, ecosystem that we are considering all the time. And this is our main contribution for, the, for, for, uh, for ROS that is developing for three main components that is 
so solution that is able to localize and map the robots in this complex environment that is woody crops and the path planning systems that are able to to make a path planning for the robots uh, considering the center of gravity of the robot but also the steep slopes slope less of the terrain and emission supervision that is not so much complex but also that is able to communicate with the most advanced decision support systems that are being developed in another uh, reference project in the european commissions like the demeter uh, project one of the main features from agro ppp that is one of our main contribution on this uh, ROS tech is uh, able and capacity to uh, extract occupation grid maps from a aerial image or from satellite image and from this uh, image can classify what is a tree what is the region of interest for a robot to operate and as you can see uh, this solution is able to identify the boundaries of uh, of the vineyard from this identification we can classify where is the place where we have a, a tree and a place that is a path planning where is a free zone for the robot uh, for the robot uh, to operate uh, in this uh, in this context and make the path planning uh, here we have some examples from some vineyards that we had uh, testing our robots um, and from this uh, from this uh, aerial image you can see uh, the left uh, image the a typical occupation grid map with white uh, dots and uh, uh, black dots where the robot can navigate or not. Uh, we are developing uh, one of the main issues that we are facing in agriculture sector is that we have a huge uh, uh, zones and we cannot, uh, we need to segment these uh, regions by interests and by uh, properties. And we are considering for the mapping not just a 3D mapping, but uh, a topologic maps to segment very, uh, several regions of interest. Okay, this is, uh, as you can see, our topological maps are very uh, uh, bigger, are very, uh, are very big with a lot of nodes, uh, but this is, will simplify the process of the robot localized and uh, store the knowledge about the environment. Uh, another, this is much, much uh, basically based on a star algorithm, okay? And we have extended this to consider the center of gravity of the robot, but also to consider the steep slopeness of the, the terrain. Uh, from a digital elevation, to, uh, from a occupation grid map and for a multitude map or a digital elevation uh, terrain map of the terrain, we are able to detect and uh, make a right path planning for the, the robot. As you can see, if you use a basic star, it will try to optimize the right, uh, the shorter trajectory, uh, but it's not the safer one. If we, we have uh, the uh, orientation taking consideration and the center of gravity, we will have uh, the safer trajectory for this robot. And this is some of a uh, few examples that we are using. This is the, the tool operating in real time uh, where we are able to give trajectory to robot and he knows uh, the right path and the safer path for this robot. It will, will find the safety path. One of the things that we are able to do is uh, if we found some, uh, uh, some object that is in the front of the robot or something that is blocking, uh, we will have uh, the path planning that is running in real time and to identify a new path planning, a new safer plan uh, for the robot. Uh, another contribution that we have made is that we don't want that the robot has the full capacity to understand and what decisions to, to, uh, to do. And so what we are developing also is a mission supervi supervisor that can receive a prescription map and after decompose that prescription map in a set of uh, actions for the robot actuations and for the robot uh, path planning. And this is something that can bring several information that is stored in Roche, but also to communicate with uh, the standards that is being defined for the meter, uh, the meter project. Okay, uh, from a prescription map that we have here, it is able to decompose uh, this information. Just to let you know, we are picking this all information. Uh, I have not spoken with about Bineslam because we have some. This is not public yet, but it will be fully public uh, in the next year. 
uh, and we hope that we have a solution for slumming for slum that is a reliable to work in woody crops okay and this will be done in ROS2 and the previous work that we have done for the uh, path planning and for the mission control and supervisor uh, we will also give a contribution that is moving from uh, ROS1 to ROS2 because we believe this uh, ROS2 will be more compatible to the new decision support systems that will exist in the future uh, in the agricultural and the forestry sector. And that's it all. I think that I uh, took the right time, uh, right? And um, it's that's it. I, if you have any question, any doubts, please don't, uh, don't hesitate. And many thanks for listening to me. And I hope that I have shared something interesting and appealing for you all. Okay. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, you have a lot of questions lined up, but we'll have it during the panel discussion session. Now I will invite Wilco Bonestro. Uh, he's a researcher uh, at Mechatronics Research Group in Saxion University of Applied Science, uh, Onshant, uh, Netherlands. And he has obtained his PhD in Cognitive uh, Psychology from the University of Twente, Netherlands. Twente, Netherlands. Uh, Wilco will introduce us with the topic of Maverick, which is a rapid prototyping of aerial agrobots with ROS and PX4. Uh, Wilco, now you can take over the microphone. Um, thank you very much for having us here. Um, to set the stage, I um, um, show a um, video of the drone uh, that's currently uh, being developed. Um, so um, this presentation will be about agricultural drones flying objects um, uh, that can be used, for example, for precision spraying. Um, and as you can see in this picture, this is a, a rather big one. So let's go to the presentation. Um, I'm going to tell something about a project called um, Maverick. And um, it's an older project. It started uh, three uh, three years ago, and last year it was uh, completed. Um, so I will um, explain uh, where we were at the start, um, what we have done in that project, and uh, the things we learned, and the things we are currently working on. Um, so this presentation uh, will be about um, uh, aerial agrobot, so a, a drone. Um, so why use drones in agriculture? Um, we've already heard uh, like soil compression as a, a big problem in, um, in, in fields. So when heavy machines uh, um, uh, move over the same position uh, several times and the, the soil gets uh, compacted, um, one um, yeah, logical solution to, uh, to um, bypass that problem is to use drones so that you don't press on the soil anymore. Um, moreover, drones can uh, quickly cover a field and uh, it's, it's rather easy to have uh, uh, put sensors on it to get an overview of uh, what's going on in the field. So a short thing about myself. My name is Wilco Bonestro. Um, I'm a senior researcher in the um, uh, mechatronics research group of Saxion University of Applied Sciences. Um, my contact information will also be in the last slide and uh, um, you can find it online. Um, my background is in computer science and I, uh, um, three years ago I uh, transitioned to robotics. So the uh, whole robotic thing is rather new for me, um, but the software thing is, uh, is the thing I like. So the um, link to ROS was uh, rather, um, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a clear choice to, uh, to go into that direction. Um, I work at Saxion University of Applied Sciences. Um, we are a middle big um, uh, university in the um, eastern part of the Netherlands. We have three locations. Um, I work in Enschede. It's uh, really close to the German border. We have about um, 27,000 students, um, 2,800 employees. Um, and, and the main business of the University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands is education. Um, but we also have 33, uh, 43 research groups um, and um, they uh, kind of work um, together with companies to do research. 
So what do the research groups in our university um, do? Um, I Most of the time, if I have to explain what we do, um, we are the kind of R&D department of, of Saxion. Um, we do applied research. And it means it's, uh, uh, we typically don't work on um, fundamental uh, questions, but um, most of the time they are really concrete questions from companies. Um, a lot of them are startup, startups or um, small businesses. Um, our group, we have uh, two professors. Um, we have a, a large group of researchers. Um, most of the people are also teachers within the university. Um, and we also have students and external experts in our project to, uh, to work on the, the projects we, we uh, perform. We are a, a fast growing group. So um, about four years ago, we had three researchers. Now we have 16 and we are still growing. Um, we have a big range of people. So um, some have PhDs, masters, bachelors. Um, we also have students and interns uh, in the group and also students working in projects uh, on the, the research projects we work on. And um, also the background is really diverse. So mechatronics, electronics, mechanical engineering, and computer science, um, all projects have a kind of uh, um, yeah, a group with, uh, with different people. And we focus on two things, autonomous systems and industrial robots. And especially autonomy is interesting for, um, for the agricultural drugs. So where do we put our research? Um, I hope that you uh, um, are um, familiar with uh, the technology readiness levels. Um, it's a kind of description like how mature is a certain technology. Um, and uh, basically you start with knowledge development, you have technology development, and in the end um, you have business development where the, the product is actually made. Universities are typically uh, on the, the left side of the picture. So the, the um, fundamental science, um, Industry is on the right part, so making money out of it. And uh, basically we're somewhere in between. So what we typically do is take new um, initiatives that are developed, um, uh, try to make prototypes and um, uh, hand it over to, to companies or work together with companies so they can, uh, can make products out of it. Um, I will show some examples of things we are working on. For example, uh, we have a project um, together with a company that makes um, asparagus harvesting robots. Um, this is one of the first prototypes we worked on together with, uh, with two companies. And this is really a machine um, that can, uh, can take over the manual labor of harvesting asparagus. It's in slow motion. So typically this is uh, where a company comes uh, like with, with questions or challenges and uh, together we, uh, we can develop these kind of, of prototypes. We're also working in, um, in another project with a company called uh, Rivo. Um, it's, it's also a local company. They develop technology for autonomous um, uh, mobile robots uh, and they are uh, focusing on robots for in stables. Um, they are feeding robots, for example. Um, the big challenge with these kind of robots is that they have to navigate in really contained areas. Uh, uh, it's really small. Sometimes you have several centimeters for maneuvering. Um, so um, sensor fusion is really important there. What we did with that company, um, we developed a, um, a prototype to, uh, to do some um, experiments with different sensor setups. So this is an experimental setup. Um, we use, for example, ROS to collect the data to do processing. Um, and with these kind of experiments, we can kind to, uh, can get to an optimal solution for, um, for sensor fusion on, uh, on their machine. This is also an interesting video to show um, together with a um, company called Busico. Um, we work on a, a control for a mega drone. And um, so this is already a, a bigger drone than, uh, than we normally use. Um, this one can uh, carry about 150 kilograms. So it's the payload. Um, they are kind of uh, uh, big machines. Um, in this 
set of this setup, it was used for um, carrying people, for example, uh, um, in, in military. Um, but also another application would be, of course, um, um, spraying, because then you can uh, you can carry a lot of uh, of liquid and uh, and spray it. This is a video I want to show because it's really related also to the project's uh, Maverick. Um, at Traction, we have developed a docking station. Um, this is the prototype, so the plates on the ground, um, and it can be used for um, automatic charging of drones. So if a drone lands on the platform, it, uh, it can be charged automatically. Um, the difficulty is we are looking at autonomy. So um, this was autonomous takeoff, um, and it can, can start um, uh, missions. Um, but we also want to have automatic um, uh, landing, precision landing, and that's the big challenge. So this is a, a video of precision landing. Um, in this case, there is nobody involved in controlling the drone. So this is a, an autonomous flight, um, and the challenge is to, uh, to land on the platform on the right. Also, I show some um, footage of uh, experiments we, we did with, uh, with different types of drones as well. So in both um, uh, videos, no, uh, nobody is controlling the drone. The, the um, docking, the landing is, is done autonomously. And that's one, one big challenge. So now we can go to the Maverick project. Um, we are focusing on an autonomous uh, aerial robot for um, both inspection, but also for treating crops. And um, in the project, we had several building blocks that were important. So autonomous flight was one, precision landing, um, the definition of missions, like how to give a task to the drone, um, HMI in general, and uh, eventually integration. So get everything on the, on the real drone. Um, on the right below, we see the team that, uh, that started on this project. Uh, in the middle is Abertje Mersha. He's one of our uh, professors and uh, he focuses on uh, autonomous systems. So we had some um, design considerations um, within this project. So how are we going to um, uh, attack this problem? And um, it's different from the people before. He said, we, we do everything with, uh, with ROS. Um, for drones, we typically uh, do not everything with ROS, but we also use um, a flight controller. And um, there are two um, well-known flight controllers open source available, um, Ardu Pilot and uh, PX4. Um, those are um, software stacks and you can run it on, uh, for example, Pixhawk hardware. It's a, a real-time controller uh, that's put on the drone. Um, so those are tip suitable for typical real-time um, control and, and sensor fusion. But we also use ROS for, um, especially for high-level application development, so more complex tasks. Um, so it's suitable for fast prototyping, um, but we it's also really handy for using uh, non-standard sensors. So if we use a GPS or an IMU, it can easily be attached to the Pixhawk. Um, but for example, if you want to experiment with new cameras, um, it's far more easy to develop that on a ROS system. Uh, and also things like image processing, it's, uh, uh, it's easier to develop and, uh, and to run on, on a separate system. To connect those systems, we use um, MavLink and uh, MavROS is a package uh, that's kind of a wrapper around MavLink. Uh, MavLink is the way to communicate with with the Pixhawk system. Um, and uh, so that's for us the way to communicate between the PX4 and ROS. And we arrive at these kind of pictures, these kind of system architectures. Um, so on the left, we have the docking station and that, that's typically the thing that, that are on the ground. So we have a docking station and a, a web-based client where people can, uh, can enter the, the mission. On the right, we have the Pixhawk controller and um, Basically, uh, typical hardware that, that can already be connected to that one will, will be done there. So real-time control, real-time uh, sampling, um, and also the uh, like um, uh, sending commands to the motors is done from that, from that place. 
What we did to also run ROS on that system is um, add a small computer to it. So uh, we had the Raspberry Pi and for example, the thermal camera, um, there were no drivers for it to attach it to a PixHawk. So we connected that one to the Raspberry. Um, and um, so we have running um, ROS on the Raspberry Pi and it can communicate with the flight um, controller. And for example, um, what we did in the project to um, make the precision landing available, um, we used that thermal camera. We have done a lot of experiments, first with uh, GPS, RTK GPS to do precision landing. Um, and we had to land on the small platform. And it was quite a challenge, especially when it's windy or when you get um, interference from uh, like uh, the, the GPS uh, was not, not coming in correctly. Um, so we looked for uh, what kind of sensors can we add to the system to make it more robust. Um, and we found like a thermal camera um, and a, a small hotspot on the docking station to be the, the, um, the most robust um, combination. So we have a camera looking, uh, looking downwards. Um, we have a small spot in the middle of the, the docking uh, platform and um, that spot can heat up and uh, so when the drone wants to land, um, if the spot is, uh, is um, hot, it's uh, clearly visible in the thermal camera and we can use that for controlling the drone for the, um, for the landing part. Um, also in the picture, we had on the um, left part, we have the docking station and the, the web-based GUI. Um, it was a typical um, a problem where we run into um, often is how, how can you control the system? So we need a good um, HMI. Um, within the project, we developed a kind of framework to do these kind of things. And this was quite some work. So a lot of uh, uh, time we spent in the project was spent on this part, like developing a connection between, between a, a low level system and a, a, a GUI interface um, in the end. The result was something like this. So we could uh, do mission planning. Um, uh, we, had, uh, we used Electron um, uh, um, JavaScript. Um, so you can kind of uh, indicate the area where um, the action should be taken. Um, uh, you can also monitor during the mission what the drone is doing. Um, and we have developed things like uh, alpha segmentation. Um, so if you uh, draw an area where, um, for example, spraying must be done, it uh, will be segmented. Uh, there will be um, lines uh, defined in the segments. Um, all the dots will be uh, found and they will be uh, connected and you have a flight plan. Um, basically, we did not um, the um, uh, uh, the ID is uh, just based on a paper. So um, it was just the implementation on the real robot to, uh, to, um, to, to make the demonstration. Some things we learned. Um, so we had spent quite some time on developing the software for um, uh, making the web interface. In the meanwhile, PX4 community had picked up um, gRPC as an open source RPC framework. Um, basically, it does the same thing that, that the thing uh, uh, the framework we had developed can do. Um, but now it is backed up by a large community. And uh, um, we also found out that for a research group, it's really hard to um, kind of maintain uh, the framework that we had developed. So big lesson we learned is um, stay in touch with the community. So both with ROS and PX4 and know what kind of things are going on. So for us, um, eventually, we are now using the thing that's adopted in the in the community. Um, it takes considerable time. But it's really important to actually uh, contribute, but also know what's going on in the community. We have some ongoing developments. Um, currently, in the, the end product you saw, like the, the big drone flying, there's no ROS involved anymore. So ROS was in the prototyping phase. And um, when it goes to an actual product, a lot of companies decide to, um, to not use it anymore. So they do it on flight controllers or embedded systems. Um, we are now transitioning also to ROS2 to make that part a little bit easier, also to use it on actual production systems. Um, it's really nice that ROS2 um, can easily be used also with PX4 because there is a bridge 
to um, to connect it to the DDS that's used in in ROS2. Um, we already have uh, um, been able to su successfully connect to a flying drone um, over DDS. We have several projects going on on autonomous field robots um, with Dutch companies. This is Oddbot, a small company, and this is Pixel Farming, another company. Uh, they are developing also autonomous robots. We are focusing on end effectors and especially on autonomous navigation, the things we also saw in the presentations before. And some new things um, where we are um, aiming for and also looking for uh, others to, uh, to collaborate with. Um, advanced simulation is a thing we are now um, setting up um, for to make machine learning possible, um, but also to uh, develop control and manipulation in simulation. So for example, picking, uh, picking a crop might be an interesting thing to, to work on. Also a big topic is multi-robot uh, collaboration. And for example, uh, a typical uh, subject there is a combination of drones and ground robots together. So have a drone fly over a field, um, um, find out where things should be done, and then uh, do that with the ground robot. And also an interesting thing is drone manipulation. We often see drones flying over fields, uh, looking down, um, but we also have drones with um, actuators, so um, manipulators that can actually pick up something or uh, uh, do manipulation on the ground. Okay, that was it for um, my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention and um, feel free to, uh, to ask questions. Uh, thank you, Wilco. It was an informative presentation on aerial agrobots. Uh, now I request all the speakers to turn on their camera and microphone so that we can uh, go for a panel discussion. So we have uh, some questions lined up from the audience. Uh, we'll go through it. Um, so the first question is, uh, which components? Uh, so the first question is for Heiko. Uh, which components of your research are available open source, uh, such as CGI rendering, simulation data, or camera drivers? At, at the moment, uh, uh, none of the data are uh, open source available. Um, as I mentioned in the um, in the presentation, we have yet started with the uh, with the research project, and of course, uh, during the research project, we will make all the data available. That's the plan for the next year. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we had also some problems uh, caused by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic this year. So we were not really able to perform a lot of field tests and uh, all this. So everything is a little bit shifted uh, to the next year. <laughs> OK. So you have an another question, uh, Heiko. So what is the efficiency or accuracy of the models trained on synthetic data to detect and classify real plants? Mm -hmm. uh, this is okay, something I mean, which I have in common. Uh, yeah, you can tell me. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's also uh, uh, um, a little bit problem to say that already this year, um, because we were not really able to perform the field tests that were planned for this year. So um, we also haven't published any results yet. Um, so we need to make a um, scientific analysis uh, we have to shift that to the next year because we don't have all the data available that we need to um, to make a conclusion out of that. Okay. So Heiko, you have another question lined up, uh, which is of course. how can an actual usage of ETA rope look like when respecting current safety standards for machines in agriculture? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really a big issue. Um, the safety concerns uh, um, is, a, is a huge problem. Um, I know that there is also a lot of discussion going on in the uh, in the EU to um, um, to basically form some kinds of, of uh, uh, norms um, that you have to follow to provide these kind of safety. Um, so um, currently, uh, what we think what the easiest implementation would be of such robots is that they are still supervised by um, some um, some workers. So, for example, a worker can could supervise multiple um, of these robots which are performing the tasks on the field. Um, but these um, um, field workers they don't have to be 
really experienced in the in the in the processes. They just have to take care that uh, no human or animal or anything like that uh, will be harmed by the robot. And of course, you could supervise multiple robots at um, as once. And um, also for us, like a, a really promising development, of course, is the um, the efforts in uh, in the area of um, autonomous uh, um, cars. Um, I mean, everybody knows companies like um, Tesla, Uber, and so on, for example. And um, we share quite um, same characteristics, I would say. Um, even it's a little bit easier um, on the field because we are just a lot slower. Um, but um, the whole problem um, uh, in, in the context of safety is, uh, is similar. So, um, and new developments, for example, in the area of um, new sensor technologies or, or more affordable sensors um, will make also a big impact in the area of um, agricultural robotics. Hmm. Good. Um, so there is one question to Heiko, but I think it's common for everyone. Uh, why, can, why we cannot see the use of legged robots in agriculture fields? Uh, so what do you think about that use of legged robots and uh, yeah can I, uh, can I, mean, I yeah. jump into that yeah yes. yeah, uh, yeah we'll go sure yeah I, I think it's a, um, it's a, a really interesting question um, uh, when I speak to um, robotic people a lot of them are more used to either drones or um, uh, wheeled robots um, we had the first discussion, for example, with a farmer, and the first thing he said is, why is it driving? Why is it not walking? Um, so I think it's a logical um, step also to, to take a look into that direction, because um, especially with biological farmers, um, currently they, they, uh, um, they don't, don't use that much machinery. Um, they also walk in the fields, and they have, uh, like, their um, fields are not that clean as what we see in most pictures. So um, it's, it's more logical to have like kind of legs somewhere in between and uh, you don't have lanes over there, for example. So it's, I think it's a really logical direction also to, uh, to start uh, working on. That's an interesting answer. Uh, so Philippe, you have one question. So at the end of the presentation, you said that you will integrate uh, into ROS2. So what kind of advantage does it have? Which packages do you exactly prefer in ROS2? And what are, what are ROS1 missing for your applications? I think that is the middleware where we, we speak about the, the communication process uh, in the ROS2 is more clear and more safer than in ROS1. Uh, it can be interoperable, for instance, with the new concepts of decision support system that are being developed in the agricultural sector. And the FTPPS uh, too is something that will benefit for sure, uh, this interoperability. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, and there is another issue that is, uh, we are at INESC, we are developing uh, software uh, insurance uh, systems that can look for all system. And there is one thing that we cannot ensure in the ROS one, that is the middleware for uh, message exchange is a mess to, to certify that. And I believe that in ROS2, it will be a bit easier to certify that, uh, that process, that process, yeah. Uh, that's just, just, just one question, yeah. just uh, to, to reply to the last question. I, yeah. I, I agree that uh, legged robots will make sense, but for instance, when we look for spraying uh, products in, uh, in farms, for sure, I think that wheeled robots will make some more sense because the payload, it's, it's bigger. It's uh, 100 kilograms sometimes. Uh, but uh, just to mention also, uh, we are also looking for um, legged robots because we have steep slope vineyards that they don't have uh, slopes. They have uh, um, walking places that you can just walk. And so you cannot put a, a wheeled robot there. So. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that answer because uh, one thing I find fascinating with legged robots is that uh, it leaves very uh, little footprint uh, once it goes through the farm uh, compared to a robot, like a wheeled robot. So in that sense, uh, especially with, as Wilco said, in organic farming, uh, since farmers like to go through their fields with the leg, similarly, the robot can walk through the fields. 
and that makes perfect sense and there is one last question hey towards heiko uh, are startup ideas around it Ita, itarob still on and yeah this is an interesting question so is there any so, startup sorry, ideas sorry i didn't understand this Uh, is there any startup ideas around uh, ah. Rob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, there is. Um, there is already a, a startup founded. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called AI Land. Uh, I think you can already find that. So one of the uh, uh, researchers of the of the group um, has founded a startup in this direction. Yeah. Oh, that's that's perfect. So yes. <laughs> okay. So I hope all questions are answered. Uh, there is uh, one more question towards Heiko. Uh, so, regarding functional safety, is your soft safety not part of the safety design that would be certified? And uh, continuation to that question, we have not had good results with the outdoor scan three scanner that your slide shows. Can you comment on it, please? Um, I mean, the first question about the certifi uh, certification process. Um, I mean, we are also like a University of Applied Science, right? We are not we are not developing products, so we are mm -hmm. really developing prototypes. And to show the um, um, to demonstrate um, how you can um, how you can create such systems, right? To to okay. demonstrate the technical functionality. Then in the end, yeah. So uh, that, that's that's of course then the next step right and um we um have like the the safety concept that we follow uh, in in the project is really that we have that we that we separate it so basically we have one uh um lower level uh, safety which is uh, um, hard real time which uses um, standard industrial components so the standard um, 2d uh, um, auto scanners from zig for example and um um, radar sensors um, which are processed in, in real time on the PLC so basically this is but this only provides the functionality in the end okay there's something in the uh, there's some obstacles now you have to stop and that's it right yeah. so there's no more information and uh, what we did then is we on top of that basically we created this um, high level um, if you want to call it like this high level um, soft safety components which basically enables us then in the end to um, implement um, preventive behavior such as uh, um, um, yeah, um, bypassing, for example, or that you in the end classify really the obstacles. So that was the main goal. So um, that you generate more information. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first question. Then the, the the second question, I did not understand that. So which uh, which component was not... Uh, uh, so we have not had good results with the outdoor scan three scanner that your slide shows. With the Austar, with the yeah. with, with the with the three uh, three D lighter. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, we are using uh, a new version of the Austar scanner, which is um, uh, which has the it's the um, O zero, I think. Uh, I'm not so sure. The one with the ninety degree opening angle. Uh, okay. in um, um, so basically vertically it provides a 90 degree opening angle which is really nice because you can um, detect obstacles or even like complete humans um, even if they are really close to the robot that is the actual sensor what we use um, could be that in the slide there's an older one and uh, for us that works quite well um, um, because I mean, it's, uh, it works better uh, in, in our opinion. Um, for example, if you compare it with this classical Velodyne uh, um, uh, PLP 16, for example, they always have these vertical opening angles of um, 30, 40 degrees. And of course, you miss then there are a lot of information if the obstacles are quite close to the robot. Okay. So I have a question to uh, Heiko and Philip, uh, which was not clear from your slides. Uh, which computation unit are you using on your robots? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, I can start. <laughs> yeah. So basically, yeah, Heiko, you, you can, can start yeah. then. Okay. Uh, so um, we use uh, um, we use an um, outdoor uh, graded PLC as like mm -hmm. low level controller. And uh, an embedded um, um, PC, like an, an embedded industrial PC, which is, for example, also carrying the um, um, 
um, the graphic cards or the GPUs then in the end that we use for all these um, um, AI methods. Yeah. From our side, we are using industrial uh, PCs also uh, and mainly communicating with CAN uh, bus. Okay. And for AI processing, we are using TPUs uh, from the Google most of the time. Uh, but we are shifting, shifting now for Xilinx uh, context, uh, considering their Bibado tool. And we are experiencing what are the main benefits between TPU against uh, FPGI with their DPU and their technology. We are not really sure what will be the best uh, solution at, at this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so Heiko, are you using uh, GPU for uh, online segmentation and CGA generation or you are doing the CGA generation offline? Uh, no, so um, all, yeah, basically everything that we need for, for the process execution or for the navigation, we do then, of course, online. So the whole uh, um, workspace monitoring system is, uh, uh, is working online and um, as well uh, as the um, plant detection and segmentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so now it's time for us to end the session. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. We had an excellent uh, presentation from your side. So see you. Bye.